So um, we're going to move on to um, the next two talks. Um, and it seems that we may have some technical issues with our first presenter. Um, so I, I think I might have to step in um, there. Um, but I, so I maybe not going to feel the need to, um, to introduce myself here, but I can certainly, we're going to go back to back with, um, um, with myself now and, and, and Celia Schiffer. So let me introduce Celia. Uh, to the audience. So Dr. Celia Schiffer is the, the Gladys Smith Martin Chair in Oncology, Professor of Biochemistry and Molecular uh, Pharmacology and Director of the Institute of Drug Resistance at the University of uh, Mass Medical School, where she has been on the faculty since 1998. Dr. Schiffer has a BA in Physics from the University of Chicago, PhD in Biophysics from the University of California, San Francisco, and postdoctoral training at the ETH in Zurich, Switzerland, as well as Genetech, Genentech South uh, San Francisco. Dr. Schiffer's contributions to science are in defining the field of drug resistance um, and developing framework to avoid drug resistance from the very initial design phase. So look forward to hearing how she applied this to, uh, to MPRO. So with that, I guess I, unless Stephanie is back, uh, I will present on her behalf. If I can get the slides up. Okay, I'm told to go to Celia, so let's um, let's go to Celia then. Well, thank you very much, uh, Julian, and and. Uh, uh, Hopefully you can you'll hear uh, Stephanie's talk after mine. Uh, it was I was supposed to come uh, after hers, but uh, I think this fits very well with the theme that Dr. London just uh, presented about d finding inhibitors to MPRO. And I'm going to describe our strategy of preemptively avoiding uh, drug resistance using a technology that we've developed called the substrate envelope. And you know how do we go about uh, avoiding drug resistance. And I'm a structural biologist and I think about evolution and drug resistance often occurs where there are mutation in the drug target that allow it to retain function while no longer being efficiently inhibited by the drug. And you've heard many of the speakers talk about uh, the evolution of the SARS-CoV-2 and other related viruses. So this is definitely a very uh, timely matter. So how do we think about this? We think about drug resistance in terms of uh, thinking about our enzyme target. And as you know, you know, when we are looking at a drug target, how it interacts with the substrate and it makes this functional complex in a disease, uh, as the disease progresses, you have an unhappy patient, uh, in this case, uh, infected with a virus. A lot of our standard approaches to drug discovery, I would argue, fail to avoid drug resistance because you're screening against a particular target, whether it's high throughput, uh, computational or experimental screening. If you're uh, lucky, you get a hit. And if you're very lucky, you know, it's, it's bioavailable and all the things that you guys know better than I are necessary for drug development. Uh, but in a quickly evolving disease, resistance occurs and the inhibitor doesn't bind so well anymore and the enzyme is able to continue to function and recognize and process the substrate. So what we have uh, realized in my lab that what is that if you look at the enzyme substrate complex and use that as an added constraint in structure-based drug design, you can develop inhibitors that are less susceptible to resistance, especially if that enzyme recognizes multiple substrates so that it's more evolutionarily constrained. And you can design inhibitors that fit within what's called the substrate envelope. Um, and these inhibitors still need to be all the good things that a good inhibitor needs to be. They need to be potent and bioavailable. But uh, they should be less susceptible to resistance because a mutation impacting them will simultaneously impact the recognition and processing of the substrates. And so these inhibitors should be able to be potent not just against the wild type form of the enzyme, but other polymorphisms or resistant forms of the enzymes. So compared to more traditional methods of drug design where there's lots of opportunities for resistance potentially to occur, 
we uh, decrease the probability of resistance by having inhibitors fitting within the substrate envelope with the idea that disrupting a drug target's activity is necessary but not sufficient for developing a robust drug that avoids resistance. And we've uh, applied this strategy to a number of different viral proteases. Viral proteases are ideal for this strategy because they cut many diverse substrates and they were re required for viral maturation and a critical drug target as Dr. London just described. Um, we did this initially on HIV protease where uh, the, this enzyme uh, cleaves 11 diverse substrate sequences. We uh, solved crystal structures and developed the substrate envelope and designed inhibitors that were uh, had picomolar affinity uh, and fit within the envelope and required uh, on the order of 10 mutations to uh, cause resistance in viral culture. So by employing the substrate envelope, we were able to really uh, minimize the chances of resistance. We've also done this with the hepatitis C protease, where we uh, use the same strategy of, of solving crystal structures of substrate complexes, defining an envelope, and then designing inhibitors to fit in the envelope. So here's the, the substrate envelope of the hepatitis C protease, and the primary sites of resistance in, in the hepatitis C protease are just outside the substrate binding region, uh, like it's shown shown in the cartoon uh, that I showed you previously. The uh, three primary sites of resistance are an arginine that goes to a lysine, an alanine that goes to a threonine, and an aspartic acid that goes to an alanine. And if we could show the movie, please, uh, the, uh, the, the primary uh, resistance is right where the inhibitor protrudes outside of the substrate envelope and uh, packs against the uh, packs against this arginine. And if this arginine goes to a lysine, uh, you get resistance. You lose the nice aromatic stacking. Or if this aspartic acid goes to an alanine, you lose this ionic uh, basket, if you like, and you get resistance. But this inhibitor is a nice macro cycle that fits within the substrate envelope. And so another inhibitor, the uh, Grisoprevir that uh, is, is a clinically uh, approved inhibitor packs against the catalytic triad. So it avoids some of this resistance profile, but rather uh, it has a macrocycle that circles this little alanine that's shown below here. And this alanine, uh, if it becomes a threonine, causes uh, resistance to uh, the grisoprevir. So in this case, you want to get rid of the macrocycle that's outside of the substrate envelope, but retain the ability of grisoprevir to pack against the catalytic uh, triad, so uh, which avoids resistance uh, and can't mutate. So if you look at grisoprevir compared and other FDA approved drugs, uh, they all have this macrocycle. And so we wanted to remove the macrocycle between the P1 uh, and uh, P3 regions of this, these inhibitors and include the, the macrocycle of the first drug I showed you, denoprevir. And so we did this for a series of inhibitors um, <clears throat> and combined the, the uh, functions of packing against the catalytic triad uh, with staying within the substrate envelope. And we're able to get very potent inhibitors against the wild type and resistant variants. So we're able to avoid resistance better than uh, some of the currently used compounds. So the strategy of the substrate envelope works. So here uh, we come to MPRO. And MPRO is very similar to the viral proteases in, in other viruses in that it cleaves a number of different sequences. And the, there are a total of 11 different sequences that MPRO uh, cleaves with a, a wide variety of substrate uh, specificity. Only the glutamine at P1 is conserved, but otherwise there's a large variation. So the substrate envelope technique we thought was an ideal strategy. So we initially uh, performed molecular dynamic simulations on molecular models of the substrate envelope and, and calculated uh, molecular models of the substrate envelope. This technique of parallel molecular dynamics is actually something we use in other aspects of our research that to predict resistance that I don't have time to tell you about today, but is, is a way of understanding subtle differences between uh, different complexes. And we then subsequently uh, solved crystal structures, first of 
product complexes and were able to get crystals of, uh, luckily, as, as you got from uh, Dr. London, the uh, MPRO crystallizes very readily and we were also able to get high resolution crystal structures of all these complexes and are able to now start elucidating the, the substrate envelope of MPRO with uh, for initially of product complexes, uh, but you can see the, the based on global alignment, how these uh, substrates overlap and, and can imagine the, the subsequent substrate envelope. So we're in the process of uh, working with the uh, Novartis team to incorporate substrate envelope in the design of inhibitors and uh, really use this as a strategy to preemptively avoid drug resistance. And I hope I've convinced you that the substrate envelope approach is both a way to define resistance, but also provides a, a real guide to avoiding resistance from the get-go while retaining potency. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank the members of my team who have done all the work that I've presented, uh, as well as uh, the Novartis group uh, that we've been collaborating with. Thanks very much for your attention. And I think we'll have the second presentation. Yes, let's please switch. It does seem like Stephanie is not going to be able to, to present. Um, so I will be I will be presenting. Okay, so I will in the next ten minutes we'll uh, um, summarize uh, some of the efforts that we've uh, we have been involved in. Um, if I can, since I wasn't actually, there we go. Trying as a speaker. All right, I think I figured out how to move the slides. Um, So MPRO, uh, we were um, particularly um, interested from, from the start of the pro program in, in focusing on MPRO. Um, it, it's a cysteine protease that cleaves the, the viral replicase polyprotein. Um, and unlike uh, the, the PL, uh, uh, cleaves the, at the majority of sites of the, the polyprotein. And it really has no known homologs in the, the human genome, which makes it particularly attractive from a, from a safety perspective. Uh, and it has an active site that's well conserved among different coronavirus, uh, going back to the few words I uh, had in, in the introduction around thinking of not just this uh, pandemic and this uh, coronavirus, but also potential future coronavirus. Uh, we're very interested in having a, a pan um, a pan inhibitor. Um, so our goal is an oral, um, from the start was an oral pan and pro inhibitor that uh, will broadly target beta coronavirus um, and, and was certainly profiling uh, against other coronavirus and, and, and keeping an eye on, on potential uh, activity against uh, gamma and delta. And uh, from the start, we really focused on non-peptidic chemical matter, and, and I'll show you how we went back to screening to identify uh, non-peptidic chemical matter, very much like what um, Dr. London presented. Um, and we're, we're quite agnostic at this point in terms of um, MOA and covalent versus non-covalent um, mode of action. Um, we developed a, a couple of screens, a fluorescence intensity uh, assay that we use for, for high throughput screening that has a, is quite sensitive and robust and high throughput, allowed us to, to, to quickly test a, a large number of compounds. We also developed a, a label free, um, unlike the, the fluorescence intensity assay that uses, uses a label on the substrate, uh, we have a mass spec assay that uses a non-label substrate and in our hands is, is a more sensitive assay. We can go down to, to, to lower level of, of proteins as we now our primary uh, assay um, for the program. So we, we tested a number of compound collections from, from, um, from, from the Novartis uh, deck, um, a, a library of electrophile that we initially screened, but also assembled uh, some libraries based on virtual screening, based on the knowledge we had uh, at the time uh, when we started back in, in, in February, uh, what was out there and allowed us to do some virtual screening and identify a number of, of ligands from, from that. Later on in the program, we, we did screen a larger set of, of subset of the Novartis um, full deck. Um, and this allowed us to uh, identify several, several starting points. Uh, this is how we, we progress our compounds um, through uh, the, this, this mass spec assay that I, that I described briefly. Uh, this is our primary assay uh, that allows to identify potent compounds that can progress to uh, through the uh, CPE assays that measure antiviral activity uh, in, in various cell lines. We 
routinely put co most compounds through um, the, the beta coronavirus or C43 and 229E that, that, that these are B, BSL2 assays that allow us to, to um, uh, run these assays more routinely. And we have a suite of assays, obviously, to, to characterize those compounds, including um, SPR um, uh, to determine K on K off. Um, we've adapted the Takeda method and allows to um, also uh, assess commitment to covalency. And obviously, uh, MPRO panel, human proteases, and, and all the in vitro and me, uh, DDI, and safety assets that we need. And, and, and then further progress compounds through low dose uh, RAT PK, IV, PO studies and, and, and ultimately uh, pushing compounds through further characterization uh, in human airway epithelial cells, animal models, and, and, and looking at combination studies. So uh, through this um, um, uh, um, scheme, we, we identified multiple distinct chemotypes that we were able to validate by, by crystallography, both, both covalent and non-covalent scaffolds with, with really favorable properties. And the, the, the space fitting models show you how we uh, were able to in interrogate the calytic pocket in various ways. Some of these uh, um, ligands um, interact with the S1 pocket or all interact with the, the S2 pocket. And you can see that uh, from the solubility and intrinsic clearance data here that we uh, were able to, to validate compounds with good, good properties, good starting point for, for optimization. And um, as we, we progressed, um, this is data for, for one specific series and, and the non-peptidic uh, lead series that's really characterized, we're really focused on, on compounds with good properties. You can see here the, the C log P here, we're in a very narrow range typically uh, between two to four um, and, and get a range of, of potency on, on, on MPRO. Um, but most of these compounds have, 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 have no hydrogen bond donor count uh, or, or one or two at a maximum. So again, here yeah, we're in a very favorable space for optimization of oral ability and, and, and we see fairly minimal uh, shift going from the biochemical assay to the, to the cellular assays. So um, we, we have been able to um, achieve uh, antiviral, cell-based antiviral activity, and we see a good, good, good correlation. You see here on the, on the x-axis, the biochemical IC50s, and on the y-axis, our cellular IC50s, again, um, a, a fairly tight range and, and, and good, generally good, good correlations with, um, um, between biochemical and, and cellular activity. Um, and, and I'm illustrating this with, with this compound, our, our lead compound uh, with a an IC50 of 36 nanomolar in our biochemical assay that uh, translate into about 260 nanomolar in, in the SARS-2, SARS-CoV-2 CPE assay. Um, and we, we have also some activity on, on the, the beta coronavirus, OC43, and, and alpha coronavirus, uh, 229E, both in the biochemical and, and the cellular assays. Um, the, the, this, the, the nice profile I showed you in terms of uh, FISCAM and me uh, does translate in, in vivo, and we, we generally have nice in vitro in vivo correlation, uh, um, and, and the nice properties uh, do translate into oral viability uh, at low dose um, and, and with, with low clearance. As you can see here, uh, we have good permeability, um, low intrinsic clearance, again, that translates into low in vivo clearance and, and good oral viability. Um, as I said, we have good in vitro in vivo correlation that also translate in terms of the, the, the poor solubility of the compound or optimizable solubility of the compound at this point. And what we've seen at this level of solubility is under proportional increase in exposure going from, from 3 to 30 milligram per kilogram. So um, uh, definitely a, an area there for optimization um, uh, for this series. Uh, and in terms of... Um, uh, Safety profile and drug drug interaction profile. Uh, so far, we haven't really seen any um, reversible inhibition on 3A4 to C9 to D6. Also, I haven't seen uh, time dependent inhibition of 3A4, generally, no safety signals uh, in HERG or other cardiac channels um, or, or uh, a primary or extended um, uh, safety panels. We've also um, characterized these compounds against the number of human proteases that are listed here, and uh, they are, again, generally. Uh, quite quite selective against human proteases. So, again, a, a, a solid, really solid lead lead compounds to 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 optimize uh, and, and take to to toxicology studies. So, uh, in summary, um, we've uh, developed um, what we thought until now was the first rapid fire mass spec spectrometry assay, 
uh, with uh, screen hundreds of thousands of compounds and, and identify a non-peptidic lead series uh, that allows us to generate both covalent and non-covalent uh, molecules that have cellular activity and, and, and good ADME properties suitable for optimization. Um, the good in vitro properties I've translated into suitable uh, right PK properties, and um, we're uh, uh, busy now really optimizing this compound and um, selecting a compound for, for toxicology studies. And with that, I guess I will put back my uh, session chair hat and um, I haven't been able to monitor the, the, the question pen, but uh, let me do that now. So question for Celia, um, so I can maybe just catch my breath. Um, Celia, <laughs> can the virus just make mutations at the substrate envelope and then confer resistance? Uh, have you tried to select resistance with the new inhibitors targeting substrate envelope? Yeah, and I, I think there was another question about uh, mutations remote from the active site as well. So I'll answer both together. So we have had the opportunity okay. to uh, to select for resistance in, with our HIV protease inhibitors that are these extremely potent inhibitors. And together with Ron Swanstrom's lab, we did many, many generations of selection and took got uh, micromolar resistance against picomolar inhibitors and then did deep sequencing. And the mutations were throughout the enzyme. So they weren't just at the active site around the substrate binding re region, but throughout. Um, so mutate, you know, the, the enzyme has to be able to retain the ability to recognize and cleave substrates. That's absolutely critical for the virus to to uh, to be active. So if um, if if the evolution occurs remote from the active site, to understand the role of remote mutations, what we've done was to develop a, a method of molecular dynamics and machine learning where we can we can unravel the uh, pathways of resistance. And that was beyond, you know, what I could speak about in 10 minute, a 10 minute talk, but that's definitely, you know, both in the active site, it seems that uh, really constrains the evolution of resistance quite a bit by having uh, the inhibitors in the substrate envelope. It requires at least 10 mutations. Okay. I hope that was clear. Yeah. Uh, question. Yeah, I think that was very clear. Um, question. Question for Stephanie. Uh, me. Um, can you comment on potential advantages of combining AMPRO inhibitors with other MOAs against SARS two? Um, yeah, I think that's something that we're we're definitely planning on on, on assessing. Um, yeah, I, th I think AMPRO is a is a very attract attractive target in the sense that we don't. I think it's going to be tough. Um, really to, 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 to raise mutation at the catalytic site. It's only what we've seen so far. Of course, there hasn't been pressure on, on the catalytic site, but all the um, uh, mutations on MPRO are, don't, don't seem to be impacting or are distant from the catalytic site. Um, this can only uh, get better with combining with another MOA. So we're, we're certainly uh, very interested in assessing uh, combinations as soon as... Um, um, and I, 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 I may, can probably speak for the field here as soon as we have the, the tools to, to actually uh, do that. Um, that I think it will, it will definitely raise the bar to, to, to raising resistant mutations. And I do believe these are all the questions that we have. I could ask myself some questions perhaps, but <laughs> we get a bit into comedy. So <laughs> maybe, um, Maybe it's time to wrap up. Thanks, everyone.